Um, so here they are featured. And uh, we have about 20 minutes left. So we're going to go ahead and uh, and open up the Q&A portion. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand, although we do have a shortened um, Q&A uh, time. So, um, so we'll try to get to you if you raise your hand. Um, so my first question is, since the China study has come out, have there been any reputable studies that have come out designed to uh, to um, understand the correlation between diet and health outcomes that either support the the conclusions of the China study or challenge them? No, um, I, I, I mean, you might think it's a bit of a bias on my part in this case, but uh, there are lots of books that have been coming out from time to time. Uh, but they usually focus on, they're usually written by people without training in nutrition. That's my first point. And, and, and without having that background, that understanding of what nutrition is, uh, it lets, lets some people to, to choose. But, but, you know, I got one here. I'm going to tell right now if I have it. I just got one the other yesterday. I don't see what, where it is right now. Uh, oh, no, well, I have it here. I'm sorry about it. Well, you know what? You're going to be speaking tomorrow, so maybe you can bring it tomorrow. And we yeah, can yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one that just came out, uh, and they sent me a copy, and uh, I find it really kind of attractive, quite, quite good. Um, but uh, you know, Esselstyn, Dr. Esselstyn, a good friend of mine, he came out with his uh, reversing heart disease thing. We kind of worked to have worked together over the year on the funding terms. Um, uh, I can't, I can't really say. I should think it's some more, but there's almost none. I, uh, every there's a lot of noise about this. I I have to say that the one discipline in this area that should be at the top of the list, as far as you know, doing the really positive stuff, are the chefs. The chefs, uh, you know, we have to get very good chefs. And I've known several and they've published books and stuff like it, including my own daughter in law, Kim Campbell, and my daughter, but uh, you know, Chef AJ and others. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to put a big plug in for those people because you know they're, they're sort of uh, believe in this kind of thing, I guess. And and one of the difficulties is people, you know, they don't want to go there and there's nothing not tasty, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I say some chefs are very good at making really tasty food with this kind of food. Absolutely. And I think that, that um, when people get an opportunity to try food that tastes great and is healthy, it's much more accessible to them than just, you know, yes. knowing that plants, you know, are, uh, you know, are healthier, but may not, you know, may not be uh, as uh, um, uh, satisfying in, in their mind. So that it really is important that way. So can I say one more thing? I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. I'd really catch it. My daughter, uh, who runs our CNS project? She had a cookbook mm -hmm. called the Climate Study Cookbook. So that's her and our daughter-in-law, Kim Campbell. Yeah, I got to plug in for. I got to put a plug in for this. Oh, no, 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 absolutely. I don't want you to get in trouble. Yeah. So, um, so now when when the China study came out, I, I, there was some, you know, and not surprisingly, some debunking by somebody who. Um, you know, I've read some of your responses to that that wasn't necessarily qualified. Can you explain what the, they attempted to debunk and then your response to their debunking? Yeah, the cheap uh, uh, criticism at the time was were written by an English major, who, not in science, a young young woman uh, who was associated with a lobbying group in Washington, to be honest about it, who was promoting the opposite point of view. And and they brought up the question. She did a nice job of explaining it, this sort of thing. Said the China study is nothing more than a bunch of correlations, and correlations do not mean causation. Well, that's true if we're looking for a single agent, but that's that's not that's not the way health works. I talk about everything together. So uh, when I start looking at the, like the ratio of animal food to plant food, you know, we see these remarkable correlations all consistent. So that I want to debunk that notion that correlation does not equal causation. It's true in one sense, if we're looking for a single cause of a single disease. But it's not true. We, we don't eat things that way. When we eat the whole food, it's a very different story. Then then all of a sudden, the correlation, you only have one, uh, one uh, factor on the one axis. And that's the ratio of the animal to plant. In that case, that correlation versus causation 
criticism should be debunked. There's nothing to do with this. So that that's the first thing. I my first reaction. I I can uh, I've got a lot of other co comments too. I've, you know, there's an interesting thing. So we did that sort of in rats, showing that reversal. I mean, when we can reverse cancer in animals by decreasing animal protein intake, it's so dramatic and it's unmistakable. That that did cause ripples. Let me tell you, big time. I haven't seen a single study ever published that showed the reverse. They can't do it. So if that if that is around, that animal protein does this, that, or something else, uh, maybe in the short term, some some of these things might look like they're doing something good. But in reality, we're interested in our long term health. I think. And so any short term effects can wash up, wash out really quickly. Thank you for that. So Michael Greger will. Uh, um... Who well, you know you may be familiar with uh, would often point out like when when studies are being done that you know one of the um, limitations of the study is that it's done on rats versus humans for for example um, has there been any uh, any follow up studies on humans with regard to the ability to turn on and off cancer through diet you know I have to tell you uh, you know I don't agree with that concept by the way uh, not at all. The, the, yes, we did our, I mean, 90% of the researchers in, in my time uh, were using experimental animal studies at the time. That's the way you work with it. And I, I, and I put that uh, caution in the China study itself on page 42, to be honest about it. Uh, you know, the question is this, do I ignore what we learned there that led, led, led in turn to biological plausibility in human studies? Do I, do I ignore that? That's silly. That, that is really absolutely silly. Uh, and, uh, because the, the, the other way to answer that question is, I haven't yet found a group of people who are willing to change their diet, if you will, uh, you know, and then try some chemotherapy or try some drug or something like that, which the medical profession prefers. That, you know, they're not willing to play with their disease that way to see if this works, that doesn't work especially with respect to a drug. It's, it, I have to say, I'm very being blunt about that. This, that's nonsense. Uh, and so, uh, and that is the model for the entire medical system. We work one thing at a time. They they want to sell drugs, and you know you're going to have an answer to every single condition with a drug. That's another criticism because uh, there there is uh, there there are those who live on that principle, especially those who have MDS, because they haven't been trained in this area. And so they collect a whole bunch of facts, you know, isolated facts, and they say, "Oh, this is good. This is good. That that's not science." That's simply looking for something they like and then telling the public about it. So uh, I don't know how to answer the question. I'm trying to skirt. I don't want to get involved in uh, personal you know, criticism all more than I can help. But, you know, the, the concept that uh, foods work together, that's nature. That's mother nature. And what I came to know, really, I'm, I'm really confident of this, is that mother nature is pretty fascinating. She's had a few million years to work it out. And she takes this enormous, infinite complexity, nutritionally speaking, of foods, the right kind of foods, and creates health, period, end of story. And, you know, we can talk about one of those things at a time and and uh, and get all kinds of opportunities to, to, send, to send out signals in any which way we want. Some of them use that kind of stuff. Oh, we need meat. We need eggs. We need... <coughs> or something like that. It's totally out of context. The Greeks knew that, by the way, a long time ago. Aristotle, who uh, was around 400 BC, who learned from Pythagoras, who was in the 500 BC. Aristotle said, "Let the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that was one of the greatest statements ever made. You can't take out a part out of a very complex thing and turn around and try to fix the whole thing by working one thing at a time. It doesn't work that way. You can, sometimes you can see short-term effects, it looks impressive, but it's not the short-term effects because it actually can delay the... the, uh, the... So I, I'm trying to summarize it you know, in a short, few short words, but and I'm quite fairly critical but, uh, you know, of, of some of that kind of thinking, but I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Great. We look forward to that. Um, in your research, what have you seen the role of genetics playing 
um, it is, you know, I, I think it's often used as a scapegoat, you know, for, you know, be able to sell food and say, oh, you can eat all this stuff. And, um, and, you know, if you get sick, it's because your genes, not because of the lifestyle you're leading, what you're eating, what you're smoking, et cetera. Um, what is the role in, in cancer with regard to, uh, sorry, of genetics with regard to cancer and other diseases, um, versus lifestyle? Very great question. It's a very, very prominent question, uh, very, very foundational. Uh, the people in the cancer business, and that's the area I mostly worked in, uh, they have for years, decades, have said that cancer is a genetic disease. A lot of people say heart disease, genetic disease. What, what it means is that, you know, we're kind of doomed, depending on what our, what our family background is, what our genetic background is. I don't mean to minimize have no genetic effect because there, there is, are some differences that you can see from time to time. But even for those who have high risk, high genetic risk, they can control their problems that are more likely to occur maybe, but they can control it with the same formula, whether it was high genetic risk. I, the genetic risk, what, uh, the National Cancer Institute, NIH, for example, for years had uh, on their website, the number one thing, Cancer is a genetic disease. Well, I've gotten funding from all of my funding. I've got handsomely over the years. I know that group very well. Uh, I said, wait a minute, that's not right. You, you just try to sell products because if people believe that they're getting cancer or heart disease because of their family background, what are they going to do? Then they're, they're going to turn to drugs. And so I, I basically said, that's absolutely wrong. It's misleading. Actually, they took it down. You don't see that on there now. Uh, so, and I write in a new book I'm doing right now, I'm telling you a lot of these things in this new book I'm doing. It's just finished. I hope it's going to be coming out soon. I'm pointing out that just in reference to your question, genetic determinism is in fact, as you as you implied, is a basis for basically giving drugs because a, a comment can be made, you know, to a patient, for example, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, you, you've got it, it's in your family and so forth and so on. You've got to do this, you got to do that kind of thing instead of saying, change your diet. So with the oh. that's what, the, the, that first slide I was showing you, that's how I got into this field because we had an animal model. Some people don't, don't like it, but too bad. We got an animal model that started out with, with a genetic determinism. And what we found, it wasn't the genes that you can determine, it, it, it initiates things, but what controls it is the nutrition that controls the expression of the genes. That's what matters. And we, we can do it that way instead of trying to get drugs to manage something and sell something. It's kind of silly. So um, so on that, that topic of genetics versus the actual expression of, of disease, um, Angelina Jolie famously had a double mastectomy after um, having a, a genetic test done showing that she had uh, the BRCA gene. What do you think of those types of measures in response to finding out that you have something like the the BRCA gene in your DNA? Yeah, I know a better case. Uh, somehow I got involved in a little bit, but at that time, uh, that was probably one of the best illustrations of a gene that actually does cause some difficulties. The BRCA gene does raise risk. There's no question about that. But the, the, the important answer to that uh, is to uh, don't worry about that. Just be more strict about your, your nutritional experience. In other words, your challenge might be somewhat greater. Uh, and of course, if everybody's eating the wrong food, when a BRCA gene comes along, that's going to really get a lot of people, you know, who are who have that gene. But on the other hand, even for those who have higher genetic disposition, uh, we can control that. That's why in the animal studies I was showing you again to illustrate the point, all those animals are high risk genetically for getting the disease. But did you notice the ones given the plant protein, they did not get the disease. It's that simple. 